I'm always a little leery of these uh, electrical things. I may have told you the story about uh, I'm, I have chronic pain, and one of the things that they use now for pain treatment, which is pretty effective for some people, is what they call the TENS unit, trans-electrical nerve stimulator, and it's a little box. It kind of looks like this, but you wear it, and they have electrical electrodes that go out, and you put it, you put it at different places where your pain is, and you can control the frequency and the amplitude uh, of those with two little knobs. And I used to wear one until I, after about the fifth time, I accidentally hit the amplitude and I was going like this. Oh, oh, oh. I said, I'm going to live with the pain, you know. This, uh, okay, I think we're all wired. Okay. Uh, it is good to be back. Um, this is the second time in two days I've been in the church, uh, this church, which is actually more times than I've been in my home church in, since June. Uh, to give you an update, I've retired finally from middle school uh, as a counselor after 33 years. And that's given me the opportunity to do what I love uh, second best. First love um, is working with children, young people. Um, second love is working with the military and traveling. And so I've had uh, much to my wife's chagrin, uh, many, many opportunities to travel. Um, actually, she and my oldest daughter sat me down uh, on one of the days that I was finally home, and they said, look, Dad, retirement means spending time with family. You, know, <laughs> you need to. And so I made a promise that after December, I will not make any, book any more than two engagements a month. We'll see how that works. Uh, but it is like being home here, and I want to, um, I talked to Lolly last night, shared with her that uh, even at the dinner, people are coming up and asking about her, because I know that you've been, many of you have been praying faithfully for her. As you knew, um, you know, she, she had cancer, and uh, after the last operation last September, uh, a year ago, she's been cancer-free, and all the tests have been, have been uh, negative, so that's great, and we wanted to thank you for your prayers. Um, she really is God's gift to me. Uh, and I wish she could be or wish she could travel more with me because I always say that when I have the benefit of being certain places, um, people don't get the full benefit because she's the better half, that's for sure. Um, she is God's gift to me about, teach, taught me so much over the years about loving others. See, by nature, I'm more of a, uh, introvert kind of guy. I'm not guy, a kind of guy that reaches out. Um, but over the 40 years of our marriage, she has helped me come outside of myself. Um, actually, in a sense, come out of the cave, because some of you who may know my story, I spent two years living in a cave. And uh, until I met her, she helped me come out of, from the cave, so to speak. But she's taught me an awful lot about loving and reaching out to others. There was a time we were uh, traveling on the thruway, and we stopped at a rest stop. And this is an example about how she's taught me and motivated me and exhorted me to reach out, to become involved with other people, touch people, have an impact on them. I've taught her to be a people watcher, because uh, I just love to sit and watch people. She loves to get involved with people. You know? So we're sitting in a rest stop, and we, uh, it was at McDonald's, and she doesn't really like McDonald's, so we were just having a cup of coffee together, but we were just watching people. And all of a sudden, she, we noticed this very senior, I say very senior because now we can buy from the senior's menu. Yeah. <laughs> this was a very senior couple that came in. And we watched, the, the wife went and sat down, and the husband was up, and he ordered something and came back. And we're watching him, and he sat across from her, and he had a Hamburg, small little bag of French fries, and a drink with two straws. And he cut the hamburger in two, divided all the french fries up evenly, put them on a separate napkin, and he passed them over to her. He took his half, 
And then he put two straws in the drink. And we were kind of watching and I thought it was cute, you know, because Molly and I like to share too. You know, we're at that age too, we eat too much food, oh, makes us really sick. So we often share a meal, you know. So we thought that was kind of cute. But she was saying, that's sad, Gary. Look at, they probably can't afford anything more than this. She said, go do something, Gary. I said, just watch, Molly, just watch. She goes, no, go do something, will you? <laughs> well, with her motivation, I finally went over and I, I said, sir, um, if I could, I hope you won't mind and you won't think it's too much of an imposition on my part or stepping on any toes, but you know, we've been watching and if, you, if you're willing, we'd like to buy you, an, you know, another meal. We could, you know, whatever you'd like off the menu. And he took it very well. He was very dignified and he just said, no, thank, thank you very much for your offer, but you know, we're very used to sharing things one with another. I said, oh, that's nice. So I went back and I sat down. She goes, well, what'd she say? Well, I told her they're used to sharing. And she said, oh. So we watched him and he started eating. She wasn't eating anything yet. He was eating, he finished his meal, and she had not even touched anything yet. And Molly kept on saying, Gary, there's something wrong there. That's not right. I don't know if she was thinking kind of like a woman's liver or something. Maybe this little lady lived in total submission to this man or whatever. I'm not sure what was going on <laughs> in her mind, but she was not satisfied. She wanted me to go do something. She said, go do something. <clears throat> <laughs> so I went back and I said, ma'am, I'm really, really sorry, but my wife, <laughs> Yeah, you know, kind of like God, the woman you gave me. You know? Yeah, I said, my wife is really wondering. She said, I said, um, she's concerned because you haven't started eating yet. Is there something going on? Why aren't you eating? And she kind of smiled and she looked at me and she pointed to her husband and she said, I'm waiting for the teeth. <laughs> True story? I don't know. Uh, I was going to tell my Marriott story again, but that. Uh, you know, they say that there's three kinds of people in the world. There's people who know and can make things happen, you know. Then there's the kind of people who don't know, and they kind of just sit around and watch what's happening. And then there are the kinds of people, the third kind, who have no clue what's happening. You know. In that situation, I was one that didn't have any clue whatsoever what was happening in my in the, you know. <clears throat> but what I'm going to talk to you about today is something that I feel is a real need. Since my retirement, and even before, the 33 years that I was working with middle school kids, I was very, very concerned because of what I saw happening in the world. And I felt that there were just too many people who didn't have a clue as to what was happening. And I didn't see enough people who seemed to be knowing what was happening or who could make things happen. You see, because in a crisis and when things are happening, when there's chaos in the world, especially like after 9-11 or during 9-11, in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of chaos, you really look for somebody who seems to have the answers, you seem to, who seems to know what's going on and seems to know what to do in a situation. You look for somebody who seems to be able to make things happen, somebody who can see something that other people can't see, maybe that hears something that other people can't hear. You look for people who seem to be guided by something that other people don't have. You look for the kind of person who seems to be, just by their very presence, is able to convey a sense of peace and calmness to a situation. Those are the kinds of people that you look for when things are going crazy. We call those people leaders, some people do. And as I look and see what's happening in our country, you know, some people would say there's a lot of chaos there, a lot of crisis going on. 
Some people would even say, maybe our time as a leader is over. I don't believe that. I believe that the Spirit of God is still looking for men and for women who can bring peace and comfort to this crazy, crazy world, this crazy country, our crazy communities, our crazy families. The Spirit of God is looking for somebody, someone, some people, regardless of the age, to step up and take control, to step up and be a leader. We are in need of people who can lead today. I like to tell the story about, some of you may not know Mike Douglas, but Mike Douglas was a big talk show host before Oprah. And uh, one time he had a, a guest on his show, um, a Mr. Universe. And the Mr. Universe is a bodybuilder. And uh, he was gonna have him on to interview. And uh, so Mr. Universe came on and he had his bathrobe on and uh, Mike Douglas talked to him a little bit and he kind of said, I'm trying to find a spot where I feel like I can be seen by everybody here, but I'm glad I got a remote mic here. So he was, he was trying to talk and get a little bit to know about this Mr. Universe, you know, his motivation, what, what prompted him to do the things that he's doing, you know? So he asked him a question, he said, so what can you do? You're Mr. Universe, tell us, what can you do? So he takes off his bathrobe and he's standing there in his Speedo, you know, and he walks up in front of the crowd and he stands like this and he strikes a pose and he goes, <coughs> and all the muscles bulge and pop all over the place. And he turns back and looks at Mike Douglas and Mike Douglas says, yeah? <laughs> but what can you do? What do you do? And the guy looks kind of quizzical, and he, then he turns around, looks at the crowd again, TV audience, and he goes, <laughs> Mike still didn't get it. And he goes, or maybe Mr. Universe didn't get it. Because Mike then just said, okay, I see that. What do you do? What can you do? See, the point was, to Mike Douglas, is that, you know, life is really more than a show. Is your life a show? What I want to do in the short time that I have, and it's getting shorter and shorter, if I, if I could quit telling these stories. <laughs> what I want to do in this short time is I want to maybe encourage you, exhort you, maybe get you to examine I challenge you to look at your life, to ask yourself, do I want my life to be more than just a show? There are too many people, I believe, today who are interested in just a showy life. And that's not good, especially when I know in my heart more than anything else that God has something very, very special that he wants you to do. He wants your life to be more than a show. He has a very unique plan for you that only you can do. So I want to try to exhort you and challenge you. Let your life be more than a show, regardless of how old you are. God has something for you to do. How do I know that? Because you got up this morning because your feet hit the floor. God's not finished with you yet. He has a plan, he has a purpose. And there's something that you can do, even today, that no one else can do. Lolly always challenges me. And one of the ways that she does is she often tell me, she used to tell me when I, before I go to work every morning in middle school, Gary, remember this. When was the last time you did something for the first time? In other words, do something different today, Gary. Do something new that you haven't done before. When was the last time you did something for the first time? 
Let your life be more than just a show. Rehearsed. Don't live a rehearsed life. Leaders do not live rehearsed lives. They're not afraid to do something for the first time. And I want to share with you three things that I've learned about leadership. And I certainly don't profess to be a leader. I got out on E5, and I made E5 a couple times. I was lucky to get E5. The first time I was given a position of leadership was in basic training. I was told to take my squad and clean the latrine. I said, okay, guys, let's go. I ended up being the only one that went. <laughs> I didn't have much leadership skill. But I had learned some things about leadership because I followed some great leaders in the military. And because over 40 years ago, Jesus said, Gary, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. But you gotta follow me first, Gary. So I'm gonna share with you three truths that I've learned about leadership. The first truth is this, that if you desire to lead, you will never ever truly lead until you learn to serve. And then even more important is that you will never truly serve, truly serve in the Jesus sense of the word until you learn that there's something more important than yourself. I thought about that the first time I went, went to West Point because they asked me to come and speak on leadership and I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> Like I said, I'm an E5, but I can't even, I can't even lead five guys to, live to the latrine and have them clean it. I'm going to go to West Point to talk about leadership. But then I thought, who better to ask than somebody who follows? And I started thinking about, what is it about people who lead the men that I followed? What was it that made me want to follow them? And when I was at West Point, I was staying at the Thayer house and they have this softball field that was outside the Thayer house. And it was like a little portico that you walk into. You walk through before you go into the softball field. And they had a big sign up there that said, as you enter this field to play softball, as you enter this field, we ask of you only one thing, one thing, all that you have. <laughs> And I thought, oh my gosh, that's just to play softball. They want everything just to play softball. But that's the kind of model they were trying to instill in leaders. Whatever you do, give it your all. And I've known some great leaders who have stumbled at becoming exceptional, above and beyond leaders, because they stumbled at one thing, self. They weren't able to give all. And you can tell when somebody's not able to give all because you'll hear them say, it's not my job. You know, I did that last week. It's your turn. I told them that wasn't going to work. Leaders who don't become great because they stumble at self. I have a, I used to call him a friend, but now I don't. I feel taking too much liberty because I know him and we correspond, but I don't know as we really are friends, but Dick Couch is his name. And he trains Navy SEALs, and he used to when he was in the military. And he told me once that, you know what the motto is that we try to instill in a Navy SEAL before he becomes a member of a SEAL team? This is the motto, this is the mantra that I instill in the men. What can I do to make you look better? You imagine what it would be like to work with a bunch of people who have that as their motivation? It's not about me. It's not about me at all. What can I do to make you look better? I want you to succeed. I will do anything I can to help you accomplish what you want. Sometimes I think that's the mantra that Molly has towards me. I feel so blessed at times. What can I do to make you look better? In Vietnam, we had a saying 
that said, it was, I saw it in a special forces team house that said, to really live, you must almost die. To really live, you must almost die. To those that fight for it, life has a flavor or life has a meaning that the protected will never know. Over the years, that has really meant a lot to me, that, that little saying. To really live, you must almost die. I've expanded that to, to really love, you must almost die. And I've expanded it even further to, to really lead, you must almost die. And why did I expand that to, to really lead, you must almost die? Because the greatest obstacle to leadership, as I said, is self. That is the greatest obstacle. And why is that? Why is self the greatest obstacle? Second thing I, I've learned about leadership is that the challenge to any form of leadership, the challenge to get anybody to do anything, the real challenge is to get them to be able to give up their will to themselves. That's the challenge. Jesus knew that. He said in Luke, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up your cross and follow me. The obstacle to true leadership is getting somebody to say, not me, but you. Giving up my will to myself. Now, I've done a lot of reading on John Maxwell, and he's a great, he has some great insights into leadership. And he talks about all different kinds of leadership, and all leaderships involve certain skills. They involve a lot of convincing, persuading. There's the issue of motivation. There's the issue of encouraging. There's the issue of trying to gain compliance. And leadership people can become good managers, good administrators, and they all possess a certain amount of unique talents and strengths that help them be successful. But everything that I've read on leadership misses a very unique and important point, I think that only the leadership in the military can teach you. You see, leadership in the military is very unique because in the military, you ask me to do something and I might die. You see, military has taught me that true leadership involves being able to give up my will and place it in your hands. And it's more than just ignoring who I am, denying it, or giving up a little bit of my own interests. True leadership in the military requires a total surrender of who I am and my willingness to say, here, I put my life in your hands. That's a big thing to ask anybody. And I won't do that unless I'm willing to totally surrender my will of who I am, what I believe, all that I am, all that I have, and place it in your hands, in your control. John Maxwell tells a story about a mother who was in a grocery store with her little child, and the little child kept on standing up in the grocery cart. And the mother was concerned because she knew that if she fell, that this child would get hurt. So the mother kept on saying, please sit down. So the child sit down. But two minutes later, up again. Please sit down. Up again. This went on for quite a while. And finally, the mother, in her most stern voice, convinced the child to say, OK, I want you to sit and stay seated. So this child reluctantly resigned herself to sitting down. And as she was sitting down, Mom heard a little child whisper, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> you see, true leadership, I believe, involves a change on the inside. Anything else, sitting down on the 
outside, but standing up on the inside, that's just accommodating. And there are too many people accommodating in this world today. True leadership involves a change on the inside, a change where I say, I am willing to put my life in your hands. And if necessary, die for what you want me to do. That's a tough thing. Leadership in the military. And you can't give me a locker room pep talk. You can't encourage me. You can't persuade me. There's no way you can really convince me or argue me into being willing to die for something you want me to do. I'm not going to follow a business plan into battle. <laughs> I'm not going to follow a flow chart into battle. But you know what? I will follow something. What will I follow? I'll follow you. But how do you become that kind of a leader who can get people who, to be willing to put everything that they are and believe and have in your hands and follow you? To truly lead, you must learn to serve. To truly serve, you must learn that there's something more important than yourself. You can get me to follow you if, one, you can show me that there's something more important than myself. If you can show me that there's something more important worth living for, worth dying for, than who I am, I'll follow you. That's worth it. Let's go. But then you stop right here. <laughs> go, go. It's, it's worth it. There it is. There it is. No, I'm not going to do that. I said I'll follow you. So first of all, how can you become a leader? You have to show me that there's something worth living for, worth dying for. And then you've got to show me that you know it because you've been there. I'll follow you if you say, come on, let's go. And you cross that line where everybody else is going to stumble itself. When you cross that line because you know that over here, there's something better than over here. There's something worth living for. There's something worth dying for that's here. You've been here. And now you can come back and you can lead me. Lead me to something that's better than who I am right now and what I have. That's how you can become a leader. If you can show me that there's something there and you can show me that you know it, that you believe it, that you've been here, that you've experienced it. And trust me, as somebody who's followed a lot of leaders, I'll know if you've been across that line. <laughs> I'll know if you've been over here. You can't fake that kind of a thing. You can't fake it. I'll know. The true challenge to leadership is being able to convince me that there's something worth living and dying for and then showing me that you've been there, that you know it. But then that comes to the third point that I've learned about leadership. How can I become that leader? How can I cross this line? What am I going to have to do to learn that there's something more important than self? Simple. You got to die. <laughs> you got to die. Well, that's not any fun. No, it's not. But that's the thing that I've learned about leadership. It comes with a cost. And the third thing is, is that if you choose to be that kind of a person who wants to know something that others don't know, who wants to be able to see something in the fog of battle that others can't see, if you want to be able to hear that voice behind in your ear saying, this is the way, walk in it. If you want to be that kind of person that conveys a sense of peace when others are going crazy, you're going to have to die. And battles are going to come. But that's okay, because to really lead, you must learn to serve. And to really serve, you must learn that there's something more important than who you are. The 
bad is are going to come. And the other thing I've learned from the military is that no matter what war you fought in, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, no matter what war you fought in, the battles are fought and they're won or lost in two places. And it's not Iwo Jima. It's not the Battle of the Bulge. It's not Quezon. It's not the Chosin Reservoir. It's not Kabul, Kandahar. Battles are fought, won and lost in here and in here. When you're in a battle and you hear medic, you fight a battle. You fight a battle here and here. And that's where the battle is won or lost. Because that's when you either decide to stay down and hide or go. Battles are won, lost, but all battles are fought in your mind and in your heart. You want to be a leader, your battles are going to come and they're going to challenge everything about who you are, everything about what you believe. Battles are going to challenge every decision that you've made in your life about whether or not it's real and whether or not it really, really works. And you're going to find that when those battles come, that some things that worked yesterday aren't going to work today. And things are going to die. Parts of you are going to die. Things that you believe in, things that you consider strengths, things that you considered abilities, things that you used when you, when you were facing challenges and you mustered all your stuff together and you met that challenge and you accomplished it and you said, yes, I did this, great. Those things are going to be challenged. And there'll be a time when they aren't going to work this time. Parts of you are going to die. It's what I call a crisis of confidence. Things that you believe in and trusted in are going to fall away. But that's okay. Because what is left, and there will be something left, what survives is really going to be real because now it's been tested by fire. Now you have gone beyond self and you've found something that's greater than self. You've gone over here. Self has died here and you realize I'm still here, but a lot of me is still back there, but I'm, I'm still here. Let me take a look and see what is this that's here? What's left? I came across a great quote and I posted it on my Facebook page. <laughs> it says, when you have nothing left but God, then for the first time, you become aware that God is enough. When you have nothing left but God, then you be can become aware for the first time that God is enough. And actually, he's all you need. All that I am, all that I have, all that I believe in, I'll shed it right here at self, and I'll cross that line to be able to have God here and find out that he is enough. That's what's going to be left when you get over here, is God. Paul said that in Romans 8 when he said that, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's that struggle, the suffering right here at self. It's not, it's not worthy to be compared to what I have over here. And what do I have here? Christ in you, as Colossians says, the hope of glory. What I have here is God, as God really is, without any trappings of who I am. This is what I want. 
when you get to that point in your life when you have nothing left but God, then for the first time you become aware that God is enough. And what else is left? This is probably the most important thing that's left is that now I have a vision and every leader needs a vision. Every leader needs a vision. And my vision now is much clearer because now self has taken off. All these glasses that had self, my self-interest, my motivations, my dreams, my desires, my plans are gone. Well, now I've got just clear vision because all I have left here is God and I can see with his eyes, I can see with his vision. And what can I see? My vision now helps me to look beyond the moment of what's happening right now and I can look at all the tremendous potential of that's what's there in the next moment. <laughs> that's what that vision will do. You'll come to a struggle and some people get depressed and discouraged and they go, oh, I gotta quit. Your vision will get you to be able to look beyond this moment and look at the next moment. And you say, no, we can get through this. We can get through this. It gives you the big picture. It keeps you looking forward. It helps you, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, you know, to not look at the things that are seen, but look at the things that aren't seen. Your vision will help you see the things that aren't seen because all that's seen is just temporal anyhow. And the things that aren't seen are eternal. And that's what God wants us to have. He wants to have us have a vision where we are able to see beyond temporal. A vision that gets us to see beyond this present moment where we want to quit and look to the next moment when we can see that Jesus is there that says, come on, take that step. I got you. Come on. A vision will help you to keep on track with your long-term goals. As 1 Corinthians says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. That's what a vision will do. When people want to stop here because you're tired, because you're discouraged, because you see overwhelming odds, your vision will say, no. Don't look at what's seen. We look at what's not seen. And I know Jesus can get us through and keep us going. So we have to be steadfast. We have to be unmovable in our purpose and our goal. Every leader needs a vision. But you'll never possess a vision unless you learn that there's something more important than yourself. A vision comes with a cost. got a couple minutes left. I want to close with a story that I was trying to say, okay, should I tell this story? It's 11, it's 11.29 or 10.29. I can tell the story. I read it in a book. It's called Patriot's Dreams. It's a story about a soldier, a sergeant. His name was Chris Reed. He was in the Battle of Mogadishu. For those of you that watch those movies, it's Black Hawk Down, where the Ranger Battalion, there was a chopper that went down and the Ranger unit went out to get them. Chris was in the Ranger unit. And he was in the hospital and he was being visited by a, his commanding officer. And the thing is that the Chris didn't have to go out that day. He wasn't scheduled to go, but he went because, you know, his friends went. And he said, to the commanding officer, he said, sir, the only thing I remember is I remember a big explosion, screaming, burning, fire, and the next thing I know, I wake up here in the hospital and I'm missing an arm and a leg. And then he looked at the officer and he said, but you know something, sir? Knowing what I know now, I would do it again. 
it only cost me an arm and a leg. Do you think Chris had a vision? Do you think he crossed that line? Do you think parts of himself died right here? Do you think he sees something other people don't see? Knowing what I know now, I'd go across that line. It only cost me an arm and a leg. Chris has a vision, but a vision comes at great cost. I have a vision too. I don't have time to sh share with you how I came through that, to that vision, my battles. But some of you who have been here know about my hospital bed experience. But it was a result of that hospital bed that God became my vision. And for 40 years now, he has been my guide, he has been my compass when I got lost and I didn't know the way. For 40 years, he's been my strength when I felt like giving up. For 40 years, he's been my hope when I thought that all was lost. And for 40 years, he's been my friend when I thought that I was all alone. He's been my vision through many, many battles. And I'll close with giving you my, my verse that's like my vision. It's Nahum 1 3. It's a little, there are no insignificant words nor verses in the Bible, but many people don't even know that there's a book Nahum, let alone the third verse in the chapter in one. But that verse says that God has his way in the whirlwinds and in the storms. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. That verse has brought me so much comfort throughout the years when I realized that because I couldn't see through the fog of the battle that I was going through, because I couldn't see through the storms that I was going through, that verse has brought me the security, the knowledge that those clouds are just the dust of his feet. He's there, and I'm in his hand. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Nothing can separate me from him. Death, sickness, nothing. Those clouds of my storms, those clouds of your storms, are the dust of his feet. That is the vision that guides me. That is the vision, along with the exhortation of my wife, <laughs> that helps me to reach out of myself and extend myself to somebody else and say, can I help you? Three thoughts on becoming a person who can bring a sense of calmness to the chaos that's out there in our world today. You wanna lead, learn to serve. You want to truly serve? Learn that there's something more important than yourself. And that's important because the true challenge to leadership is being able to give up that, have that person give up their will to themselves and place it in your hands so that they will do it, so that they will become changed inside and not just accommodating your request, but totally surrendered to your request. But that won't happen without battles being fought. But that's okay, in order, because in order to truly lead, you must die. But what's left is going to be a vision that will take you places where only God can take you. Would you close with a word of prayer with me? Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your example. All have been, which have been tremendous, tremendous 
guides and helps to helping us follow you. Lord, I pray that today there may be some here who say, God, I want to make a difference. Help me, Lord, to be a leader. Help me, Lord, to be a servant. Give me the grace, Lord, and the comfort to die where I need to die so that I can serve where I need to serve. Father, give me the grace, the strength to possess a vision because I do know that where there is no vision, people perish. Lord, help me possess a vision that will lead people to you. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.